I have the um, opportunity today to speak about the actual repair on the models. And that's what going forward during the course will be a common theme that will show you how we work on these models and how you should then um, reiterate the repair. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, um, and uh, start showing the video. And while the video plays, I'm gonna uh, comment on what you're looking at and um, basically explain step-by-step step the surgical repair uh, for coarctation. So the first thing we are focusing on is basically a simple, so to say, coarctation repair, um, an extended end-to-end -end anastomosis through a thoracotomy. Um, and that's probably also a good opportunity to thank Pam, uh, who has put in a lot of work uh, to uh, make these models um, and uh, to go through uh, the actual repairs with all of us surgeons and uh, made the recordings and cut these uh, outstanding videos. Um, I hope you can all see the slides. Um, so as David outlined before in his talk, um, sorry, I tried to slow this down. In his talk, we're um, in the simple coarctation, you have a fairly localized uh, narrowing of the aorta. Uh, and what we would be looking at um, prior to deciding whether to go uh, from a thoracotomy uh, approach or whether to go for a full stenotomy and patch augmentation of the arch is basically the hypoplasia of the aortic arch. Um, so in the model um, and the 3D reconstruction that you can see here, you see that um, basically uh, juxta ductal, um, there is a narrowing in the aorta and the typical epsilon shape of the aorta uh, with probably some hypoplasia of the aortic arch, but it does not appear to be particularly severe. And what we tend to look at is basically in um, uh, an echo view of the aortic arch, what the dimensions of the proximal uh, aortic arch are basically just past the takeoff of the um, innominate artery. Uh, and that would then guide us whether or not um, that segment would be sufficient to uh, basically perform an extended end-to-end -end repair or to go for a much more uh, thorough augmentation of the whole aortic arch. So basically what I'm going to talk about in the second procedure. Um, as a rule of thumb, we quite frequently use um, the kid's body weight in kilogram as the reference of the size of the transverse arch in millimeters. So if you have, for example, a 3.5 kilo kid, um, then uh, you would want to see an arch that is at least 3.5 millimeters in size. But even then, uh, you may hear different opinions. So that is certainly more on the aggressive side in the literature. Other, others would report, for example, that um, the body weight in kilogram plus one uh, millimeter is uh, um, uh, plus 0.1 millimeter is what you're aiming for. Um, but um, we've shown that um, there is growth potential in the proximal arch. I think if you speak in Z scores, it's basically up to a Z score of minus six. Uh, that where you could theoretically uh, perform a coarctation repair from the side. But obviously it needs some common judgment um, whether or not you're comfortable to do that. Um, and uh, if you're using such aggressive cutoffs, then you will see some patients coming back with uh, some residual obstruction that needs to be addressed secondarily. Um, so going forward here, uh, this is actually the model that you will be working with. Uh, and uh, what I can't really show on the model here and what obviously is part of um, uh, how these models are made is that um, you're skipping the step of mobilizing all of these structures extensively. And, uh, and to me, I think that is a very crucial thing to do um, in the actual surgical repair. Uh, make sure that you're mobilizing both the aortic arch, the descending aorta um, uh, very well, that you have control of it over long distances and that you uh, are able to pull these structures towards each other because that uh, prevents, first of all, tension on the suture line as you're 
uh, anastomosing both uh, the arch and the descending aorta back together. Uh, and on the other hand, um, gives you a better exposure of uh, the area to prevent you from uh, basically augmenting less of the aortic arch than you intended, uh, than you're intending to. Um, so I usually take quite a bit of time to make sure that everything's mobile um, and uh, free. And then, um, so that's basically what I'm showing here, that you're around the supraaortic branches, not necessarily completely around the innominate artery. And then you can start um, uh, uh, tying the duct. That's usually about the time where I give heparin at the same time, just before we're basically ready to clamp and let that circulate for a, a few minutes. And then uh, you can tie off the uh, arterial duct. Uh, obviously with the uh, attention to detail because it's a quite fragile structure at times. And then the idea of clamp positioning, and this is more or less from a rather uh, typical surgical view from a left uh, thoracotomy, you're having an angled clamp and you'll see the clamp that I'm using is not exactly the one we have in the operating room, but an angled clamp that um, uh, uh, occludes the supraaortic branches, um, so the uh, left carotid and the left subclavian, and uh, the transverse uh, aortic arch at once, and then a second clamp that is positioned uh, further down on the descending aorta. Um, so this uh, red dotted line is basically uh, the anterior uh, part of the your clamp and the um, other uh, branch of your clamp is behind these branches. And you can, as you may see in the next picture of the model, so usually we use a bit of a finer, longer clamp that has even more of an angle and kind of almost turns back onto you. Um, that makes things a bit easier in terms of uh, achieving adequate seal and um, clamping it sufficiently. Um, and uh, then you have to make sure that's what I'm pointing at here, that you leave patency um, of the ascending aorta towards the innominate artery. Uh, you usually have that um, some feedback because you um, have a right um, arterial, uh, right radial artery, uh, um, and that can show you if there's still adequate um, uh, pulsatility and blood pressure there. Um, and you can at times even clamp a little bit, sorry, that's uh, what wasn't shown there specifically, but you can almost clamp a little bit into your innominate artery, but obviously uh, you have to be very cautious not to limit the blood flow to the brain. And that is also something that um, you have to pay attention to while you're performing the repair, because if um, the assistant is holding that clamp and pushing it into the chest, you can uh, create some compression of the uh, innominate artery as well. And then the second clamp is positioned on the descending aorta. And um, what you don't see on the model here is that, and that's why that movement is indicated here on the graph, is that there are spinal branches um, going off the aorta and are usually clamp above them and make sure that I'm kind of loading these um, spinal branches with one branch of the um, clamp um, and then move it, uh, move the clamp towards the lower end of the descending aorta to occlude both the main lumen of the descending aorta and the spinal uh, branches as well. Um, so you may see that here, also not exactly the clamp we would be using in the OR, and there's a little bit of a twist to the descending aorta on the model. And then once that's clamped, the, the clock's against you, basically. David mentioned that before, that um, you know the length of your uh, cross-clamp time is uh, basically uh, what determines um, uh, the length of the ischemia of the spinal cord or potential ischemia of the spinal cord. And while it's usually tolerated quite well uh, for the time that even, even a more complex repair would take, um, you don't want to have um, a particularly long cross clamp times with the risk of um, spinal cord injury. Um, fairly rare, but it's certainly been reported. Uh, and then uh, you can uh, divide basically the ductal region. I usually start 
fairly close to the duct, as you've seen on the uh, picture there, um, to make sure that I rather leave ductal tissue on either side and resect that in a second step. Um, I think it is quite important. That's why I resect, even though the these and aorta look fairly okay there already, why I did that on the model here as well, uh, just to show uh, that you have to um, cut out everything that looks suspicious for uh, residual ductal tissue to prevent uh, that from contributing to re um, coarctation afterwards. Um, with um, in obviously having in mind that um, you can't um, resect too large segments either, uh, and then you struggle bridging the gap that you've created. So um, it needs to be obviously um, with some uh, common sense in mind. And then uh, I incise basically longitudinally um, into uh, the underside of the aortic arch. And depending on the hypoplasia of your arch, that may actually go right up to the clamp. Um, so you see that here. Um, you can even cut right up to the clamp and pass part of the sutures in between the tip of these um, of the of your clamp um, to maximize uh, the area that you're augmenting. Um, and that's also, uh, uh, I think, in a typical region where it, it becomes clear why we're measuring the size of the tub uh, tubular hyperplasia at that segment, because this is kind of as far as your augmentation can go. Um, that's the segment that's going to stay for sure as as large as it's uh, as it's been before the repair, and therefore, if you uh, can't uh, if that is inadequate in size, then that won't uh, be addressed sufficiently with your uh, extended end-to-end -end repair. Um, once you've incised that, I usually place um, a little additional stitch somewhere here uh, because it helps opening up um, the uh, aortic arch. Uh, and then you start anastomosing. Um, it's usually a backhand stitch um uh, inside out on the anterior part just before the curvature and then i'm circling around the tip of the uh, arch incision um and that is all usually done without coming up with a suture because you're suturing underneath the previous placed uh, sutures uh, and if you have a lot of redundancy there um, it's fairly easy to um uh, lock your suture unintentionally uh, or um, uh, tangle up your suture uh, some one way or the other. Um, so usually go for three um, stitches or sometimes four just around that tip, as you can see. And then um, you already can appreciate that you're kind of working underneath the previously placed sutures. And then you usually ask your assistant to advance both clamps. So um, the idea is as you're um, um, pulling these sutures straight um, and tighten the suture line, that um, you're not approximating the tissue by pulling your suture, but that they are fairly close to each other already with the movement of the clamps uh, to prevent that from tearing through. Uh, tissue in a coarctation patient, they are usually neonates uh, when you operate on them, uh, can be very fragile and thin. Um, and if you kind of force them to advance each other just by pulling the suture, then you can easily tear through it. Um, and then fixing uh, a tear in that area is just particularly tedious and uh, uh, much easier to avoid that in the first place. Um, there you can see you're pulling it shut, but you're pr basically moving them against each other already quite well uh, by uh, advancing the clamps. Um, and then you're running your posterior wall. As a rule of thumb, I would say uh, uh, you usually try to take small bites at the tip of the aortic arch and larger bites on the corresponding descending aortic segment. And then uh, as you're circling uh, around to the uh, basically end of your arch, you're taking larger steps on the aortic arch side and smaller steps on the descending aortic side. That's just to augment and tailor everything a little bit better to widen the anastomosis. And then uh, 
you've seen that uh, it's additional incision that I've made on the descending aorta that's to accommodate and further enlarge the segment. Um, probably all in this model, you could have done a much more limited extended end-to-end -end repair and still be fine with uh, the degree of tubular hyperplasia that you can see. Uh, but for teaching purposes, it's uh, nice to show um, just how aggressive you can uh, try to augment the arch. And you'll see how these things are coming back together uh, once the suture line's completed. Um, so this is um, nearing the completion there. Uh, usually this part, um, both posterior wall and uh, anterior wall is then uh, dealt with fairly easily. Uh, the tricky sutures are really just the tip. Um, and then uh, you can obviously um, tailor that as you need it. Uh, you saw, you've seen that I added an additional incision to the descending aorta just to level out everything. And then you're um, removing your descending aortic clamp or at least releasing it to some extent to de-air it. Uh, you can then also de-air the proximal part uh, and tie your suture. Um, and then uh, you gradually release the, uh, the the proximal clamp, but that's a period. So you may already notice that at the time of um, uh, the removal of the descending aortic clamp, uh, you can check if there is any bleeding from the suture line. Uh, certainly will uh, show once you gradually remove the proximal aortic clamp, and then you can either reclamp if you have to fix anything, which is fairly rare or not often very uh, necessary if you've done your sutures correctly, but it's a time period where you can uh, uh, just confirm that everything looks fine. And then uh, as you remove the clamp, you have a close eye on your arterial blood pressure um, and you've given advance notice to your anesthetist that they are aware of the clamp, clamp about to come off. Uh, to prevent uh, sudden drops in uh, blood pressure and coronary perfusion and such. And then uh, once you can safely remove that, um, you'll see that there is um, an augmentation of the aortic arch with that extended end to end. Uh, and that's where you can see like this segment still is the same. You haven't altered that, but the way the descending aorta moves into the uh, transverse arch, you see that um, it kind of gets wider as soon as the descending uh, aorta is anast anastomosed to it. So no matter how small that further distal segment of your arch has been, that is already wider the way the uh, descending um, aorta is anastomosed to it. Then you can, uh, obviously we're just looking at the suture line. You wouldn't do these moves in, a, in real life, but um, that's how you can uh, um check your if you've done uh, a correct augmentation uh, usually then uh, only um, put an additional um, suture ligation on the duct uh, to um, not rely on that um, silk tie only and then um, you're pretty much done with your repair and that is um, a simple correctation um, i think uh, one thing that is uh, important to mention for a correctation repair um, in real life is, as I said, that uh, the mobilization is important, but also I think um, it's many times perceived as a simple procedure, but it really depends on how you set yourself up. Um, obviously it applies to many other surgical procedures, but I in my experience, I think it's particularly important in correctation to um, get a sense of how to position the clamps well, how to guide your assistants to help you appropriately, uh, because it can make all the difference how much you struggle to put sutures in and how aggressively you can augment your arch if you um, set yourself up correctly and uh, get good exposure of the areas that you're working in. All right, so that is the first thing. So I'm going to stop sharing for now and um, probably give uh, the audience the opportunity to ask questions if you have any.